Welcome back to our episode 3, The Growth Dilemma, part 2. Is it possible to identify one factor limiting the growth for the aquaculture industry? My hunch is that there is a myriad of challenges. Let's check it with Juliet. This is Challenges or Solutions. Aquaculture needs to grow, but we need to grow it sustainably. Let's talk to some people to see what they think about the growth dilemma. Growing the way that you've always been growing in the fjords, but doing it in a better way, making sure that the fish eat all the food and, and that, that you have uh, uh, trying to work with the currents and stuff like that. So there's many ways, but I think still the best bet is, is going deeper and, and going further out. I think going back to not pushing nature, like with um, the small production, they used to have light 24 hours, and they're now going back to having it like more of a natural. The fish will still grow, but it will not be as stressed. You have to have good water, good feed, and also people who are interested in, uh, in biology and technology. And also we have to do mapping of the areas uh, where we can have the aquaculture so that we do operate in a way that doesn't uh, limit other possibilities in the area as well. So what's important is that we value the, the, the actual raw material, the source of raw material itself, and that we actually um, apply it to the market where it's most needed in a sustainable, ethical fashion. It is all about, like I said, monitoring, ensuring that the fish are healthy, that we have good growth cycles, and that we're doing our best to you know, make the, a living for our fish farmers while increasing the production of fish. I think there needs to be frameworks, of course, cooperations between authorities and the industry, and there needs to be incentives to do the right thing. Great job, Juliet. Lots of interesting insight right there. During Aquanur, the whole city of Trondheim is vibrant with life. It's all about aquaculture, of course. I took a trip to the Trondheim microbrewery. Sondre yep. Heide, uh, you have uh, moved out of Aquanur and taken over a microbrewery. Yep. Why? The most important thing is to have fun. If you're going to talk about coexistence between wild salmon and farm salmon, we need some beers. You have done many themes here uh, these evenings. Yeah, Monday we had the uh, young fish. On Tuesday was for the politician. And tonight is wild salmon night. Tonight the salmon is going wild. Uh, uh, and you have invited people from totally opposite uh, parts in this conflict. Yes, it's basically the idea is that the, the, the salmon lice is the common enemy. Yeah. So that's what we are talking about today. How do we get rid of the sea lice? Today it's about 480 million fish on the coast of Norway. And if we think about doubling that to 900 plus million fish, we need to do something about the sea lice. And my proposal, and it's not only my, I would say, is to separate the wild, uh, the salmon from the parasite using closed systems where you take care of uh, both uh, the escape by double uh, security but also that you don't have any release of sea lice larvae into the ocean. So what we could do is to do this as the electric car arrangement in Norway where you use uh, uh, the first 300 licenses of open net pen farmings and you convert them into to one to three, so you get uh, 900 licenses out in, uh, in uh, closed containment. So you basically take out fish and sea lice from the open ocean farming and you grow enclosed. And then you can continue with the next 200 and then you, the next 150 uh, and you're about uh, halfway uh, there. And then half of the industry is converted into closed containment. So that is the proposal, it's pretty simple, it doesn't cost the state anything. I think it's a good idea. We have been thinking about uh, the same principle, you know. The technology has been here now for many years, but we're not really seeing it developing fast enough. And it's critical now because uh, the number of wild salmon are declining very rapidly. So we need, really need to push this forward quickly now. So we need incentives. And that's what Alf Helge was talking about. And we're, of course, supporting that. And why has it taken such a long time? Summer farming has been an economical success for many decades. At a certain point of time, we need to make a transition to meet the future, and uh, that time for the salmon farming industry is now. Well, that was certainly a good time, and it's good to see that constructive dialogue is promoted. 
Next, we will meet an expert who is posing the question, is feed a limiting factor for growth? I'm here with Peter Johannesson, you're the Director General of IFFO, and it's an organization for marine ingredients. Please explain to me, Peter. Yes, that's correct. Uh, IFFO, uh, we have expanded the name with the Marine Ingredients Organization. And uh, correctly, as you said, we have our membership based in uh, marine ingredients producers. All in all, we have uh, around 80 producer members, but in total we have 250 ma members from 43 countries. Aquaculture is growing, has to grow. In the lower end, the, the pristine marine ingredients, we have stopped using them. So where, where will the feed come from, Petter? What we see is that uh, from, from a marine ingredients perspective, that makes uh, maybe less than 10% of the total feed ingredients uh, market today, uh, is a strategic ingredient now. It used to be a commodity uh, taking more than 25% in the past. The rest is vegetable ingredients, most of it at least. The growth potential in aquaculture is, is definitely there. Um, the question is if the feed is the limiting factor. Many would say it is. Uh, I'm not too sure about it. I see that for marine ingredients there is still potential. Not in wild fish capture, no more you growth. You don't do that I don't, anymore. Uh, well, we do, but uh, I don't think there's any growth there's a, there's potential. Not there. Potential. No, but I think there, there are several options that you can uh, that you can explore, and that is also being explored. Uh, one is to uh, go into lower trophic species. Uh, it's a complicated uh, both in terms of co catching and processing, but it's there. The biomass is, uh, is defined to be the big and unsustainable. Um, but what we have seen is that over the years, the volume that uh, has compensated for reduction in uh, wild catch for marine ingredients comes from uh, offcuts, from yeah. processing of wild captured food fish, yeah. of course, but also from aquaculture. So if aquaculture grows, we can also grow marine ingredients. So it's a yeah, hand these in the are egg. things that we used to throw away. Yes, that's correct. But that, uh, that actually represents a fantastic uh, volume. 40% so of the fish meal today comes from byproducts and uh, close to 50% of the fish oil comes from, uh, from byproducts. So growing that part of the raw material sourcing, I think is, uh, is key and it really represents big volumes. Uh, Petter, there are numerous initiatives on other sources than the purely agricultural or the purely marine ingredients. How do you see uh, a solution with all these initiatives? I think it's, it's interesting to see that the volumes are starting to come at least from um, the bacteria based on uh, gas. We have uh, EPA, DHA production from microalgae, uh, marine microalgae. So I think those, those additions, I have to say additions, it's not a question to make choices here because uh, we need to have uh, all options on the table and we, we need to use what we have. Yeah, everyone has to chip in. Everyone needs to chip in. <laughs> uh, and I think it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, potential here, uh, also for investors. If you're able to find good cold uh, supply chains for byproducts, uh, there should definitely be uh, opportunities there. I wish you a successful Aquanur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. One part of the growth dilemma is, of course, to get enough food, enough fish for the growing demand. And it's natural to take a little trip to China. Okay. And I'm here with CEO Vicky Go from the WeCook Group and Jan Nikolaisen, your advisor. Yes. And uh, I have to ask you first, what, what are you doing in terms of uh, getting more Chinese to eat more salmon? Yes, actually, we cook seafood. It's a seafood company. We selling salmon online, and do you know uh, nowadays how Chinese young people buy salmon today? They buy online. Yes, exactly. Douyin, it's Chinese TikTok, and young people buy it online. And Douyin announced this year's target for salmon selling. It's around one billion Chinese yuan. And that's about uh, uh, one. 
1.4 billion Norwegian krona. Yeah, 1.4 billion. That's going to be sold on Chinese TikTok. Yes, only one platform. So that's why we are here. We are struggling to get enough uh, fish fish from Norway. How, how much salmon do you want to want to buy for your restaurants and your okay. online business? Okay, normally we are uh, try to order 200 tons to 300 tons per month. Wow. But, yeah, but but nowadays we only get 100 tons per month. And the prices are good in China. It's it's a, it's a high price if you want to buy salmon in China. Yes, salmon in China is still a luxury item. Only um, maybe less than 5% population have tried it. So I think if we can get more salmon and the price is more reasonable for Chinese consumer, then uh, the market will expand. So the price now uh, is around 33, 33 US dollars? US dollar per kilogram in China retail wow. price in supermarket. You have also a solution. You are working on how to get more salmon into the market and since uh, Norway can't deliver all you need, you are going to start farming. Yes, exactly. Because we thought uh, we cannot get enough fish from Norway. That's why we are thinking maybe we can move a fish farm to China. We started already and we, has, uh, we have got a registration from the uh, local government for this project. That's why we are here for seeking Norwegian technology and equipment and, and all the... Um, Competence yeah. of, of what, yes, we, yes. what we see here. So the market for the suppliers that are here uh, is going to be vast in China. Exactly. That's why we are here to for, try to find the technology partner to go to China and build the first zero carbon fish farm. It's a last farm. Yeah, and this is connected to other industry where you use the waste from traditional industry like LNG. Yeah. Uh, get uh, water, and warm water, cold water from, yes, yes. from that and it, then you can produce the fish Yes, it's an innovation. Land. Yeah, actually it's an innovation. We use the wasted energy and it's energy recycling and it's a synergy between Norway and China. Where do you see uh, the market in, let's say, five years? In How much demand is there for salmon in China? In we count in China, we predict in uh, by 2030 we need at least 30 million tons of salmon per year. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a, a very promising business opportunity and uh, I wish you luck. I, have, I hope you have very successful days here in Trondheim and good luck in Norway and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Stay tuned people. In part three of this episode we will meet the next generation before we can expect some high-level input from some high-level people.